So, hi everyone, I'm Timothy Noble, uh, the service owner and developer for Multibio Russio. And I am, I'm here to talk to you today about Multibio Russio as a service for the EGI communities. Uh, so I thought I'd best start with what is data management? It's the practice of keeping or using data securely, efficiently, and cost efficiently. So what does that mean for you? Well, as the amount of data you produce and the number of people you might want to share it with uh, increases, it becomes harder and harder to keep track of that data and move it around so everyone has access to it. And they might be adding data on top of that. So you're constantly building more and more data. It becomes harder and harder to keep track of that. Well, Rusio provides a solution for that by integrating with many of the different uh, storage endpoints that you might have that are already in use. Um, it, uh, can talk to storage points across different sites that might have different setups and different protocols. It doesn't really mind what data it is that you're producing through your experiments, whether it's images, texts, or other tile types, it will move it around anyway. So it's designed with more than a decade of uh, operational experience uh, in a very large scale uh, data management situation with the largest instance of Rusio currently moving around several billion files and approaching an exabyte of data. Rusio was originally developed by Atlas, one of the LHC experiments, um, more than 10 years ago now to replace their older data management system. <coughs> Uh, and Rusio is still being developed with the future in mind um, with LHC run three and the high luminosity exper uh, experiments coming up. Uh, the amount of data being produced and the size of files uh, being produced is uh, going to increase. And therefore Rusio is looking uh, as far ahead as uh, that to make sure that it's able to, um, to move all this data around. But with the success of the software for Atlas, other communities have come along and also wanted to use Rusio for their needs. So other LHC experiments like CMS are also using Rusio. And also outside of uh, high energy physics, there's also uh, the SKA, so the square kilometer array, which are now also using Rusio, um, which I'll talk a little bit about, about later um, as that leads directly into our instance. So Rusio is an open source software and it's community driven. Uh, development, which means that as communities come along to use Rusio, they can uh, help uh, develop Rusio further as a software and make sure that it fits their needs as well as everyone else's. So I'll go through a few of the terms that are used within Rusio just to make sure that everyone's on the same page. So I'm going through this, uh, this talk. A rule is something that relates to a file, data set, or container and protects it from deletion within the Rusio environment, but also allows for it to be replicated. I'll talk about a little bit more about that over the next coming slides. A data set is a collection of files, and a container is a collection of data sets. RSE is something that I'll probably be saying a lot throughout this uh, talk, is basically just any endpoint that allows Rusio to copy files to it and from it. So this can be anything from a uh, a disk in your, uh, in your server, uh, a, um, a tape archive, or a cloud. And a daemon is a program that performs a specific task. There are quite a number within Rusio, and they all do different things. I'll go through a couple that you might sort of encounter in your use of Rusio uh, a bit later. So files, datasets, and containers. Files can be stored within Rusio and can be replicated using rules. The same can be said for data sets and containers. So files can be grouped together into a data set and can belong to multiple data sets as uh, is shown on the right. Containers are then a collection of data sets and containers and data sets as they are collections of files can have additional properties such as the open property. So containers and data sets are created open data can be added to them. <clears throat> but then once an experimental phase is completed, you may wish to close that data set and container to make sure that no more data can be added to um, basically add sort of a, a stopping point for that data set. This can then be closed, still accessed and replicated, moved around your RSEs, um, 
but it just creates a, a finite data set. Uh, so now let's talk about replication rules. So actually moving your data around. I mentioned earlier that a rule protects the data from deletion, but it also allows for replication across the different storage endpoints or RSEs. So we'll start from the beginning. If you've created some files with your experiment, you may wish to do an upload. This will be a simple Lucio upload where you want it to go with the tag RSE, the date, and then the list of data that you wish to upload. Rusio will then register these files within its database and set a rule for them, making sure that they're not deleted. And these then may be added to a data set um, later um, to complete the data set. But not all users might uh, be at the same site as yourself. So they can come along with their own account and add rules to those data sets. They will use Rusio add rule and the data sets that they want and move it to wherever they wish. So that might be their site, their RSE, so it's more local to them. Or if the data has just been produced, <coughs> excuse me, you may wish to have more resilience within your uh, data to make sure that it's at multiple sites should anything go wrong. So for that, you can use things called RSE expressions. This includes, uh, as an example here, the country equals UK. So in this example, that will make sure that these two data sets will be copied to two, two endpoints throughout the UK. Uh, you can also exclude sites, should that be interesting to you, or you can set various other parameters to RSEs that you can tell Rusio about later, and it will look through these parameters and make sure they match when you want to move this data around. So as we were talking about moving data around, we may as well talk about uh, the uh, space and allocation within those uh, stem endpoints, because as we all know, storage isn't infinite. So each account is given its own quota of space. Uh, the rules uh, that that account then places on files, data sets, and containers count towards their own quota. But that doesn't mean that the data is copied multiple times within that space or within that endpoint. So multiple users can have a rule on a file. For an example, we'll take two. Two users can have a rule on the same data set, let's say, and each will have that space uh, taken away from their quota, but only one a physical copy is actually present within the RSE. If a user, one of those users then decides they no longer need that data and to delete their rule, that data won't be deleted because it's still protected by another rule but it will be taken away from their quota. Rusio also understands the difference between primary and secondary data. So um, data produced from an experiment would be primary and then analysis would be secondary. So it will prioritize primary data in a, a storage endpoint RSE uh, over secondary data as secondary data could be produced again. So in the example from this um, temporary storage disk from Atlas, we can see the primary data in yellow and secondary data, data in green. And there is a space limit dotted line um, just above 100 terabytes. Rusio uh, aims to keep the data within that and will delete the secondary data as needed to fit the primary. Uh, it does this with a gap between the space limit and the actual storage limit. To make sure if anything goes wrong, there is time for admins to come along and fix any issues. So we'll talk a little bit about the architecture of Rusio and how you might use it. So you will come along using the Bastion uh, virtual machine that we have based at well, the web UI or a containerized client with your authentication details. You will then talk to the server. It will check uh, to see, who, uh, see if you are who you say you are and allow you to perform any tasks. So we'll go with an example of moving data around. Uh, you will come along to the server and add a rule to a data set, say. This change will be made to the Rusio database, and the conveyor daemon will then pick up the change in the database and uh, attempt to fulfill that rule. So it will use its own authentication credentials to talk to FTS, which Andrea will go through uh, in his talk. And FTS will coordinate the transfer of data between the various sites that you may have been added, added the rule to. 
So let's say in this case, you move the data from the disk to a tape archive and a cloud. You may also then decide that you no longer need that data on disk for whatever reason. A different daemon, the Reaper daemon, will then come along with its own credentials, but it doesn't need to talk to FTS to do anything. It will use its credentials to go straight to the endpoint, which has data there that is no longer protected by a rule, and if necessary, delete it. In our instance, also uh, as a uh, redundancy, we also back up daily our Rusio database to ensure that uh, if anything does go wrong, we have a very recent um, backup that we can fall back to. So let's talk about the setup and maintenance of our Rusio instance. It was originally set up in 2018 to support the SKA experiment. But as their knowledge of Rusio increased and their uh, understanding of their, the, the amount of data and things that they will be required that they have within their experiment evolved, they decided to use their own instance, leaving us with this, this instance that we have a RAL. We then decided to evolve our instance of uh, Rusio into the Multivia Rusio, and uh, many developers working at RAL have developed uh, Multivio functionality, working closely with the core development team of Rusio. That pretty much brings us up to uh, present day, which brings me uh, as the contact point for Multivio Rusio. Uh, so if you are interested in uh, using Rusio, please do email me. I can provide tutorials, hints and tips, and just talk through what, um, any requirements you might have and see if Rusio is right for you. We provide um, test transfers between the various RSEs that we have set up um, to ensure the endpoints are functioning correctly. This gives us a better idea of if you're encountering an issue as a user, uh, we can help troubleshoot that. I'm also working on documentation to help users and VO admins uh, to use Rusio. Uh, currently, it's available through BP, uh, but when it's more complete, it will be made available through EGI. And we also have a support email. Um, this will change in the future, but when that does change, I will inform any users. So what are the advantages of using Multivio Rusio at RAL? Well, instead of learning how Rusio works, setting it up yourself, and then integrating all the RSEs yourself, you could use our instance, which um, we are confident will be able to support many experiments, because as I mentioned earlier, Atlas is moving around billions of files and exabytes of data. So this means that there is probably much lower load from many different experiments that we can support. This means that there's only one Rusio instance that we need to support and maintain. And any endpoints uh, that are shared between various virtual organizations can be shared quickly between them, set up, uh, and just um, means that we can help provide the setup required. New VOs are quick to add, um, and I will work with the VO admin to set up the, the environment. So that's the RSEs and anything else that might re be required. And uh, we also have more contact with the developers and the large communities that have a CMS and SKA who uh, know what they're doing with Rusio, and they might provide any tips and tricks that we can integrate with our instance. So how do you access Rusio? Well, in the next three to six months, we'll be looking at the web UI, which currently doesn't function with Multivio Rusio, but we're working on it. Uh, this provides a place that you can uh, look at your rules and add rules and move data around. We're also looking to integrate with the EGI check-in and our various IAM um, services so that you can log into Rusio using your university credentials which is much easier than the current grids for Fitna. There's the containerized clients that you can access Rusio with. Um, so these are easy to install. So the containerized client uh, is installed using Docker. It's very easy to set up. There will be documentation available um, once that's complete. But until then, I can talk you through it. There's also being worked on the lightweight client, which is easier to set up fewer dependencies and therefore more lightweight and can be run without a configuration file. 
There's also uh, the Rusio desktop app, which was developed as a summer of code project in 2020. This is a work in progress, but I thought it was a very nice uh, graphical interface for Rusio that I'm looking forward to being completed uh, so it can be used by you guys for Rusio. So what are our plans for the future? Well, EGI uh, ACE is uh, supporting our forward-facing uh, developments. So the web BY for multi-view, the integration of EGI check-in and IAM services, uh, inviting you to use our multi-view Rusio uh, for your data management solution, and improving the documentation to ensure that you can use Rusio uh, easily. But as well as that, we also have internal departments to improve uh, the service that we're providing and the level of, uh, and the quality of it. So we're looking to uh, change the code for some of the demons to allow them to select for the uh, authentication credentials that needed for each of the VOs so that the demons can run more efficiently. The containerization so that Rusio can be more easily scaled should uh, more uh, people come to use Rusio. This means that we can just spin up more demons to perform the tasks. We're looking to improve our monitoring to make sure that we you know what's going on within Rusio and the various sites to make sure that the best level of service is provided for you. And through all this, we'll gain more experience with onboarding a variety of different communities with different requirements. So we're able to help more communities in the future with their various requirements. So in conclusion, uh, Multiview Rusio at RAL is available for anyone who wishes to use it. That's someone who may already be in search, interested in Rusio uh, and setting up their own instance. But if you want experience with Rusio, please come along. You're welcome to use ours instance. You can contact me for an account. Or, you know, an experiment that does want to use Rusio for their data management needs. We're working with EGI to provide this software to you, the EGI community. It's being viewed as a long-term service, so this isn't going to disappear anytime soon, don't worry. And we're trying to deploy and develop it with new users in mind who might not be all that experienced with Rusio or the grid environment. So uh, thank you. And do you have any questions? Thank you, Tim. Are there any questions from audience? You can raise your hand or you can put your question in the chat. Well, perhaps there'll be more questions after Andrea's talk. Yes, I just said that we have also a demo after my talk. So there will be like now uh, talk about FTS shorter, and then we'll have like uh, Rusio demo, which will show also the usage of FTS on the back. So maybe we'll have some question. There is one, I think. There is a one question um, from the chat. And can you say something about the metadata management by Rusio? Yes, so uh, there are a few different ways that you can do metadata management with Rusio. Rusio itself can uh, manage some levels of metadata, but you could also have a metadata server that supplements um, the, uh, the files within Rusio. So you can address the metadata elsewhere and then look at files using that. OK, is that answer your question, Manu? Okay, I think we can, uh, oh, thank you. Thank you, Manu. Thank you. Um, please proceed with uh, Andrea's talk and there's a demo and we still have a chance to ask uh, at a, at a later, later session. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Can you see? Yes, perfect. Okay, thanks a lot. So I, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to now uh, have a short talk about the FTS called in AGI, AGI Data Transfer Service. 
Uh, and then, of, as I said before, we'll have a demo uh, by team uh, about uh, Rusio and uh, how we will uh, use FTS on the back to move transfer between storages. So the let's start now. I will say that uh, um, the JIT data transfer, which is based on the FTS server, is uh, a service which allows users to uh, move a large amount of files and data asynchronously between storage location and services. It is registered already in the EOSC marketplace, so uh, users uh, from EOSC can also uh, you know, uh, contact us in order to use it. Um, and FTS itself has been developed at CERN uh, since quite a long time, and uh, basically it's a service which distributes the majority of the LHC data across the WCG infrastructure, and uh, so the first version of this service uh, the latest uh, version of the service is uh, which is FTS3 is at, in production at CERN since 2014 and uh, we use it uh, in AGI also since 2019. Uh, we have the, the prepared, prepared uh, dedicated documentation for the data transfer service in AGI uh, which will also des describe you know the, the main feature of the service. So it's a low level data movement service which allows uh, easy interaction of users in order to submit uh, transfer and also to perform administration of the uh, of the of the services. The there are for this purpose there are different clients which can access the service who provides uh, restful APIs, CLIs and Python bindings and also uh, a CC portal in order to end user to perform uh, transfer from the graphical interface and also web administrators can also use a web UI in order to perform the, 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 the maintenance and uh, activities. Uh, it allows, uh, it supports multiple protocols. So uh, the one that are coming from the grid world, let's say, so SRM, XRD or grid FTP, uh, but also in you know, more standard protocols like HTTP with DAF or S3 or um, Edge Cloud are supported. And of course, being su supporting all these different protocols is also uh, supports the ones that are available in GI, so uh, the storage solution like the cache, the app store and, and others. Um, it allows to schedule parallel transfer and optimize the, them in order to uh, get them the most out of the network and then allow uh, this basically uh, will uh, uh, avoid also burning the storages, as we said. And uh, the priorities activities uh, uh, is also supported. So basically, uh, we have transfer classification based on, on this, uh, on the user input on priorities, but also on the activities that are defined for each transfer. And for integrity, uh, the, support, the, the service support checksum and also retries, which are provided per, per each transfer. I'm going to show a little bit uh, now some numbers that uh, uh, these are taken from the presentation uh, that Mihai uh, Petraskoy, which is the, who is the uh, AGI, uh, uh, sorry, the um, FTS uh, project leader now at CERN, gave uh, at the Russo workshop last week. Uh, basically, the FTS now, okay, okay, started with WCG, but there are many non-WCG instances, including AGI, and uh, uh, which are deployed uh, uh, worldwide. And uh, uh, numbers from the 2019-2020 shows that uh, it went over the exabyte scale and uh, uh, with uh, close to or over billions of files transferred over the years. And uh, it showed also that uh, uh, in September 2021, so last month, 80% of the transfers were issued by Rusio. So Rusio basically is one of the, is the main client for, for FTS. And also shows, of course, all the different communities which are using FTS now in production. Uh, I'll show you a little bit now what is architecture of the service. So basically there are different demons which are running uh, and uh, uh, implementing different features. So the server, which is we are running the, the optimizer and scheduler uh, functionality. Uh, the QS daemon, which is the one that is performing the staging from tapes and, the perf and it allows also to perform, to perform the CDMI uh, transition. And, uh, and then we have the REST server and the WebMon, which are the client faces. So basically, user can access uh, via REST or via graphical interface WebMon, but also API that WebMon is uh, is providing to 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 the service to to the users. And uh, basically, they everything is uh, uh, so the queues and the transfer histories is then stored in MySQL. Uh, 
is it horizontal scalable in the sense that all the different daemons can be replicated on different VMs, uh, and then different service can be accessed uh, via HA proxy. There are also, of course, this also support for uh, containers uh, and the deployments uh, via Kubernetes, which also will allow this horizontal scalability. Um, and then for the multi-protocol support, each uh, uh, process which runs service it's uh, uh, used internally a library, which also developed at CERN, which is this GFAS2, which allows the, which I will give you more details later about the protocols that are support. Uh, here's a slide about the transfer schedule optimizer. So basically the, uh, you basically from the web uh, interface and from the monitoring interface is possible to understand uh, how this transfer is scheduled and the, um, and the throughput for each link and uh, the activities that uh, the service is performing. So basically the scheduler uh, prioritizes the transfer according to different parameters. First of all, the priority that is provided by the users and then some uh, the activity shares, which are weights that are associated to the transfer to the transfer labels that are also provided by the users. And then it's possible also to associate for each link uh, a share for a VO. So basically, understand for each link that uh, between source and destination, the, uh, the administrator can also decide uh, which shares of uh, VO can, uh, uh, can which instance of transfers uh, will be assigned to which VO. And then the optimizer is the one that uh, can optimize the number of transfer per link. This is based on the success rate of the link and also the throughput. And then for each uh, transfers in case of protocols which support it, we can also, uh, the service can also uh, optimize the number of uh, streams per transfer, and is based mainly on the file size and on the transfer queue. Um, for the multi-protocol support, I say that um, the, this is implemented by another library, which is also developed at the GFAL2 library, which supports uh, different protocols. As I said before, with the Swift protocol that has also just uh, just been supported and added to, to, to the list, um, there are two type of uh, um, transfers. There are transfers that are supported, so TPC, so third party copy, and protocol translation. Third party copy means that the FTS basically is steering the transfer between the storages, but then the actual data transfers happens between storage A and storage B, like uh, I put it on the left of this slide. And then uh, the protocol translation means that uh, uh, users want to transfer uh, data between two uh, storages using different protocols. So basically FTS will do the protocol translation and we stream the data between the two endpoints. And this is happening also in case two protocols, the, the protocol uh, doesn't support the party copy. So for instance, if you want to transfer between S3 storage, you will need to do data streaming and the data will pass via the FTS server nodes because S3 doesn't support the, the party copy. Uh, I will put here some uh, links to the different documentation that you have prepared, of course, based on the uh, FTS3 um, documentations about the RESTful API, the Python bindings, and also uh, we prepared also a tutorial for the data transfer and the storage. I will I also have a couple of slides describing the tutorial details. So how to configure the FTS client, how to uh, create a uh, uh, user proxy, uh, create a proxy certificate that will be used in order to uh, contact the service, how to start a transfer. Uh, this is something that uh, is available on, uh, on our documentation. And um, uh, there's also documentation about the WebFTS, which, as I said before, is the graphical interface which is uh, provided for uh, by, by CERN at the moment in order to perform transfer uh, uh, via graphical interface. And this is something also that has been documented on, on, our, on our tutorial. Um, I just want to mention then a couple, one, couple of last slides related to the latest releases that FTS, which are now also available in GI. The first one is the version three one, uh, the version three one zero, which is also um, is released like uh, last last year, and basically um, supports uh, this new US daemon, which is uh, uh, the one that is responsible for the staging from tapes, uh, which is now also available via the XRD protocol, and uh, these CDMI transitions, which are also implemented, and uh, a uh, new feature which is called the archive to tape monitoring, which is used in order to understand when uh, a file has been uh, 
safely uh, transfer and uh, store the, in, a, in a tape system, which is something that has been requested uh, at CERN for some experiments, and of course it can be used also uh, in, the, in the context of AGI. Uh, ODC support, uh, which is basically um, uh, the one that we are going to use in order to integrate also with our AGI check-in. Uh, one other uh, feature that has been uh, used and included in FTS uh, last year is the storage, storage token support. Basically, the fact that uh, uh, the FTS will be able to uh, translate uh, X01 credentials to Macaroon tokens, which are supported by some of the storage in the infrastructure. And this is used in order to perform HTTP party copy between uh, uh, storages without users of uh, credential by using a token. And then the, there, is, there, there has been a version, uh, uh, there's been an improvement of the multi-op transfer support, which means that uh, now in production, uh, uh, some experiments are also uh, used to transfer uh, uh, can submit transfer from, uh, for instance, storage A to C, but also can submit like a transfer which will pass from different storages from, so transfer from A to B and then B to C. Um, and then there is a new version that has been just released, so it's not available in production yet, but uh, this is something that uh, will improve the service stability, uh, it provides some functionalities like support for Swift, as I said, SRM HTTP support, and uh, tape destination file repo, which is another uh, functionality that uh, um, has been has been included lately. And uh, concluding with the, the FTS installation that are available for the GI users, so we have uh, uh, two installations. One that is part of the GIS project, which is managed by the by STFC. And then uh, we also sub, the GI user can also use the the FTS public instance at CERN. And then is also providing this uh, web typical interface. And uh, what uh, we are going to do during the AGIS project, uh, uh, we're basically in the roadmap for FTS is the support for GI check in. And this is something that uh, will follow, is following all the activity that uh, uh, at WCG and also OSG are driving in this area. So the moving, for instance, uh, most of the traffic to HTTP or uh, using the ODC uh, OpenID Connect via YIM. Uh, we have already started with some uh, piloting uh, in the, using the FTS public instance, so which is now using, uh, which now supports a GI check-in, and then of course we'll need to, to test with all the storage providers in order to uh, perform the, the needed uh, the, the, the activity related to this activity. And of course, we uh, need also to, uh, and, and the roadmap for the AGI, for the GIS project that is also the integration with the Web FTS every uh, check-in. Uh, yeah, that's it from, from my side. Uh, I don't know if you have any question now or after the demo. If there are any, ah, there are already question in the chat. Um, what will use case of transferring from A to B to C instead of direct A to C? Yeah, basically the, um, uh, there is there are some particular use cases where uh, the um, uh, either the, you know we know already the the link between uh, A to uh, C it's a weak link so basically from the transfer point of view it's it's faster to move data from A to B and then B to C than directly moving from A to C this is one possible thing or in order to uh, uh, perform so we know already that A and C are uh, using different protocols so uh, to access and basically we would like to uh, instead of streaming the data from a to c and passing by a, um, passing by fts basically we will uh, move the data from a to b using the same protocol the party copy and b to c using another party copy so basically in order to avoid that the data are string are um, streaming to, to to fts these are the two possible uh, use cases for, for this multi-hop uh, functionality. Is that, is that answer your question, Andrea Christophe-Burry? Okay. Okay. Now we see another one. Uh -huh. I want to transfer data from old storage, one beta, one million file. 
your new ones. Task will be, let's say, uh, have a way for a scenario in parallel. Yes, design for the task, longer than it will take to compare the optimizer sync. Uh, okay, yes, basically, uh, this is one of the uh, tasks that FTS, of course, can, um, can work on. So basically, uh, having the uh, the possibility to uh, to submit transfers from the old storage to the new one, and then they will be scheduled uh, uh, on the FTS, uh, uh, you know, based on the uh, uh, the activity that uh, you, you basically that the difference between our sync and FTS is the fact that. Uh, for FTS, you will have to uh, define uh, each file um, uh, one by one. So let's say that, uh, for instance, uh, when you submit the transfers, you will have to uh, define the uh, list of uh, source files that you would like to uh, transfer and also the list of the destination files, where so where the files should be, um, uh, should be written. So this is the difference that I see mainly when you use, for instance, RSync or when you use FTS. So FTS is done in a way that uh, you will have to specify the source file and the destination file. So uh, this is the only thing that uh, that I see. Now, while you're sync, you know, you, you can do it like uh, in a different way. Uh, while for uh, this particular use case, uh, you, you can also, of course, uh, use uh, FTS, but you will need this preparatory work in order to uh, to specify what the source and the destination. But then, of course, FTS will do the job, so it will uh, transfer the file and uh, uh, between uh, the source and destination. Okay, we can hope it is fine. And there are quite a number of uh, questions. Another one. Is there any plan for EGI development development guide for other service to be become available? Do you foresee adoption from many site providers? Uh, development guide for either service to become available. I mean for storage. I didn't, so I didn't get this question. Which uh, which service to become available? Maybe you can unmute uh, and uh, you can ask. Let me. Uh, who who is uh, who? They, they didn't give a name, so probably we come. Uh, we go to the second uh, uh, next question, and then probably uh, one you can clarify your question. Next question, how do you plan to monitor the availability, reliability of this service? Uh, so the, the okay, the, I think it's uh, it depends, of course, on the service provider, but uh, we have, uh, uh, of course, monitoring probes, which are available uh, both at CERN and uh, STFC in order to monitor the, the service availability. There is also a possibility to monitoring to monitor it via Argo, there are already, which is the monitoring service uh, available uh, in AGI. So there are already probes which uh, uh, contact uh, the service in order to understand if uh, uh, the service is, up, is, is running like uh, as it should be. So if there are like, uh, if, if, for instance, if not, there are no transfers that are stuck on the queue or there are transfers that uh, are um, there are not all transfers that are submitted, for instance, uh, months uh, months behind, and they're still not uh, 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 they're still not uh, uh, basically executed by the service. So this is uh, basically so there is local availability by the service providers, and then there are the testing performed by uh, the Argo moni the Argo monitoring, which is the AGI uh, monitoring system. Mm -hmm. There are still questions, but I'm a little bit concerning of the time. Probably we coming back to this question after that demo. Is this fine? Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can, we can first go for demo and then we coming back to people's question. Okay, I see that maybe the, 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 
sorry, just to, because this was a question that was raised before. So for the the service deployment guide, uh, I mean the FTS deployment guide and the Rus deployment guide. Well, this is something that, uh, so as a GI, we don't provide like, uh, uh, so so we, we provide documentation for the service to be used, but not for the deployment, because this is basically uh, deployment guide that are coming directly from the from the providers of the service. So there is a Rusio deployment guide that are, this is coming from the Rusio uh, product team. And that, of course, there is an FTS deployment guide, which is coming from the FTS deployment team. For the multi-view Rusio, which is something that is STFC uh, development, for sure, there should be, I guess, some <laughs> some some deployment guide for the multi-view Rusio, given that this is something uh, that uh, is uh, has been developed by, by STFC. So maybe you can give some example already. I don't know if you have already a deployment guy uh, team for the for the multi-view. Um, so we're probably not going to have a deployment guide for the Rusio service itself, um, but we could work with uh, people that are using Rusio uh, if they decide that you know they need their own instance rather than using ours. Um, but there will be guides on uh, how to set up the containers to contact Borussia um, and things like this, uh, and just generally how, how to use it. But deploying the whole Multivio Borussia service, I don't see us publishing a guide for that. And okay, there are also a question about uh, from Renato. I think that we can also discuss now and then we go to the demo. So for the X509 usage, uh, there is uh, not a deadline for this. Uh, so this is something that uh, we didn't put it on our roadmap. And um, for the amount of data per entry, you should check with WCG because <laughs> this is something that is WCG specific. So <laughs> uh, it's not. <clears throat> Sorry, I will say that we are um, working with Fermilab to do a uh, multi PO uh, Rusio deployment. So there might be some uh, documentation um, generated through that that might be made available. Um, okay. Okay, there's a last question from Renato. Is there an estimation of the amount of the data generated by RAN3? Or you already answered that? No, I said that this is uh, specific for WCG, so it's okay. uh, <laughs> something to, to, uh, to check with, uh, with WCG. Okay. okay, and then we can go for the demo and people probably continue thinking about the questions. Sure. Okay, so I'm going to stop my screen, okay? Okay. Right. So first of all, I thought I'd best show off the Rusio web UI. Um, now it isn't functioning on our multi-view Rusio currently, but I can give a brief tour and that might give you some idea on um, how you might do some of the things I'll show you with the command line interface. So currently you can log in using our password or X509 certificate, um, but this will be improved with the EGI check-in and the IAM integration to use your university credentials as well. So in this case, I'm just going to log in with my X509 certificate uh, and part of multiple VOs. So it will ask me which one I want to log into. And in a moment, there we go. So uh, this will be more populated uh, when it is actually functional, but we can go to a section, we can view the rules uh, for my account, uh, which endpoint the data is at, what state it's in, and how long ago. Uh, we can do things like request a new rule. So we can say, 
um, uh, which data we would like to move. We would then move on to where we would like to move it to. We can check how much data space we have available on that RSE as well. And any additional options like things like lifetime, how long we want that file to remain there, uh, protected by a rule, how many copies, things like this. And then there will be a summary of all that information you put in uh, so that you can review that before submitting the rule. There's also things like monitoring, um, looking at the subscriptions and rules, that page breaks, so I won't look in there. You can look at the various uh, endpoints and uh, quotas that you have. Again, this will be functional later. Uh, also, accounts and RSE management. Uh, that one's been forever. So I will go through a little bit of the command line using. Um, so this is using a, a containerized client accessing uh, Multivio Rusio. So this is a screen that you might see when you log into a Rusio using a containerized client. So uh, let's first of all uh, do the Rusio command, and it will it will output all the various options uh, that are available through Rusio and how you might access them. Um, so the one of the first couple stages of logging into Rusio that you might want to do each time to make sure it's functioning perfectly is a Rusio ping, and this will return the version of Rusio that is currently working. Now, when I do this, this will actually error because we're running uh, multi-VO Rusio. So in our instance, uh, there's a couple of ways of um, specifying uh, which VO you're trying to log into, which um, I will do this way most of the time, uh, just because it's more consistent uh, for a demo. But you can also... Um, Oh. There we go. But you can also uh, export the uh, Rusio VO as whatever it might be. So in my case, it's D team, it's a three letter character is DTM. Uh, we can then um, check to make sure it knows who I am, and it knows that I am T Noble, my email address, uh, and when my account is created. So everything looks great. Um, all right, let's just try on, perfect. So let's say I've just created some files and I would like to upload them. Well, I would input a command that looks a bit like this, uh, specify my VO, Load where I want to load, upload it to, what is my scope. So a scope is a kind of um, area that you can um, uh, put various different files in. So you could have a scope for each user, a scope for a specific experiment or subset of experiments. Oh, uh, uh, Costas, yes, I'm authenticating with an XO509 proxy. Um, and then you would specify um, the files that you want to upload. So let's go ahead and do that. It's um, fine. And these files are now uploaded. So I can do that for one site uh, or another, but uh, just to keep this um, uh, a bit more brief than uh, before, we can see that there is now a hour rule for each of those. Um, uh, files that I've just uploaded, protecting them from deletion. So I could now um, create a new data set. So that is, um, to begin with, it will be empty, but I'll populate it. But that's a collection of files. So again, I would say, which VO I'm part of, make a new data set, and what it's called. I can then Um, I would then say I would like to attach files to this data set, and they are this file and this file. And those are now um, connected. This hasn't created a new rule anywhere, 
but Rusio knows that these are now a data set. If I now say something like, as a rule, I would like this data set to be in two places across all of the RSEs that I have available to me. I can do something like, uh, like this. So I would have the number of replicas that I want across my RSEs. And the RSE expression here is star, which is all. So I can do this. A rule has been created. So you can see that with this uh, rule ID. And then if we go back and look at the list of rules on my account, we can see that there are two files there. Um, and it's currently um, attempting to, it knows that two files are OK and two files are replicated. I don't know exactly how long it will take to replicate those files currently, um, as the demons sleep if there's not enough activity going on. So that might be done within the next 10 minutes or so, which might be beyond the demo. But also, we can look at another aspect of Rusio while we're here, because some of you might be from the Rusio admins for your VO. We can look at the Rusio admin. So this has a various um, different sections to it. So users can look at this section, and there are some useful tools in here. But generally, uh, the VO admins would use this section. So you can look at data, the accounts, uh, the identities, which is how would users um, log in, uh, authenticate with their account. So for example, I could have a password identity and an X509 uh, proxy identity. And those would, could both be used for me to authenticate with Rusia and perform tests. We can look at the various RSEs and the information regarding that. Uh, scopes, as I mentioned, these can be uh, like little um, bins for files to go in for either users for their own personal data that they're analyzing, moving around, or for more, ex um, more experiment-wide data. So you might have a scope, for example, um, for the outputs of what your experiment and that scope will be your primary data. Um, so within this section, you can um, you still need to log in with the um, virtual organization, but we can have a look at the RSEs. Uh, if you just do this, it will give the options. Uh, Oh. Adding dash dash help to almost anything within Rusio will provide a list of the commands available to you at that point. It's very useful. So within RSE, you can see that you can uh, list all the RSEs that are currently available within that DO, add, update them, get some information about them. So we can get some information on uh, our local site to me, which is this one. And this provides information about um, what its ID is. So this is an internal Rusio um, ID for endpoints. So even if multiple VOs are using the same endpoint, it will know the difference between them. So um, it won't be able to copy files from one VO to another and it specifies which um, FTS is being used, um, what kind of deletion is going on. So we're currently using greedy within ours. So any rule not protected by, sorry, any file not protected by a rule will be deleted immediately rather than waiting for space to be filled up to a point where it needs to be deleted. And the protocol. So we're currently using this protocol, um, but there are many protocols and things somewhere like um, move here uses the web dabs protocol instead. Um, yeah, I can't think of anything else to really go through. Um, I've done the basics of uploading files, adding replica rules, and some basics that Rusia admins might be uh, using to set up their RFCs and things. Uh, it's very quick to set up new RSE. I was tempted to do a demo on that, but um, uh, I don't think the time would have permitted just about. So that's all from me. 
Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, we have a question in the chat from Costas. He said, uh, he, he said you ask uh, whether the authentication is uh, only with X509. Uh, yes, yeah, so I answered that during the demo. I authenticated this time using an X509 proxy when I was using Lucio. Um, but I could have uh, authenticated using a password, uh, though that's not sensible 